things were much the same on the German side. The Kaiser's grand plan for a glorious Prussian victory had come to nothing. It had all gone terribly wrong, and there was nothing he could do about it. He had always spoken about war, and he had had all these um, bloodthirsty words, but he had never thought about the deed and what it would mean. The power was taken by the generals, um, Ludendorff and Hindenburg. They outmaneuvered him totally. The Kaiser, who started out with the war, assuming that uh, he would handle things, that he would take control, as the war went on, so he was revealed for what he was. Really an empty barrel. He simply had no idea of how a campaign should be conducted. And in the end, he simply stayed near headquarters, congratulating the soldiers, handing out medals, inspecting troops. This is really what he was best at and what he preferred doing. By 1916, things were changing in London. In December, the liberal Lloyd George became prime minister. He simply refused to supply the thousands of men the generals required. At home, he encouraged George V to set a good example to the people and give up alcohol, which was causing a drink problem with munitions workers. George V agreed. Based at Buckingham Palace, he and Queen Mary worked all day and rarely dined out in the evenings. They shut down Balmoral and turned some of the royal gardens over to potatoes. They disapproved of the rich who carried on much as usual whilst the poor had to queue for food. They complained to the government that five shillings was not enough for a war widow's pension. At South Coast Silo, the news from the Eastern Front was bad. Tsar Nicholas, egged on by his dominating wife Alexandra, decided it was time to take a firmer grip on his generals. But unfortunately, he lacked the military experience. Perhaps his decisive mistake uh, was that in the most difficult time he appointed himself as a commander of the army. Now all responsibility for the defeats in the war fields uh, was on the shoulders of the Tsar. And of course he had to be outside the capital, St. Petersburg. And his wife, the Tsarin, uh, now had more influence on the state affairs. In fact, Alexandra began to rule Russia herself, listening largely to the ever-present Rasputin for advice. Orders were dispatched all over Russia from her mauve boudoir at Sarsko Silo. It is from her mauve boudoir, from her bedroom, that Alexandra set out to control the destinies of Russia. And Rasputin uh, would simply tell her what to do. He'd say, sack this minister, dismiss that minister, let's appoint this minister, she, believing in whatever Rasputin said, simply followed his advice with really very, very disastrous consequences. By 1916, the soldiers on the Eastern Front were beginning to revolt. There were mutinies, and discontent spread from the battlefields to the cities where the people were starving. There were demonstrations against the government and against the Tsarina, whom they no longer trusted. Tsarina was German by origin, and there were rumors that she intrigued in favor of a separate peace with Germany, that it was a direct connection cable uh, from her bedroom to the German uh, military headquarters, and she would report everything. And not simply the soldiers or uneducated peasants would believe this rubbish. And not only in Russia. In Britain as well, war-weary people began venting their feelings on local Germans. It was terrible. I mean, people would kick dark swimps off the pavement. Uh, and anyone with a German name, if, if there was a shop with a German name, they'd throw stones through the window. And it wasn't only German shopkeepers who were in trouble. Saxe Coburg Gotha was not a good name for a British king. The royal family's German connections now became a real problem. What are you talking about? There are rumors circulating that we are supporting the Germans because we have a German name. It's so ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> 
what do they want then, say? For us to change our name? The genealogists, if that's the word, did come up with um, a couple of alternatives, one being Whipper and the other being Wetmore, both of which I think were eliminated because of uh, comic potential. I have and it was in fact Stamfordham who came up with the idea of the House of Windsor. Edward the Third. Edward the Third, we're going back that far. My family has nothing in common with Edward the Third. Edward the Third was often known as Edward of Windsor. I suppose nowadays uh, it would be called we'll rebrand ourselves and what emerged was the House of Windsor. And of course it was absolutely brilliant because uh, the profile of Windsor Castle is probably the best known and best loved outside London that there is. But in Russia, nothing could help the Tsar. George V noted in his diary, March 13th, 1917, bad news from Russia. Practically a revolution has broken out in Petrograd and some of the guards' regiments have mutinied and killed their officers. Nicky is at headquarters. But Nicky was no longer at headquarters. As revolution broke out throughout Russia, he was making his way back to St. Petersburg on his royal train. Halfway there, the train was stopped. Nicholas, Tsar of all the Russias, was forced to abdicate before he could continue his journey back to Sarsko Silo, where the family was under house arrest, waiting to hear whether they could leave the country and go to England. But in England, the public was less keen on their arrival. At Windsor Castle, a decision was about to be made which was always blamed on the Lloyd George government, but was in fact the personal decision of Nicky's devoted cousin, Georgie. It's becoming increasingly clear to me that because the Romanovs are my family, it's putting me in a very unfair position. Unfair, sir, in the sense you are obliged. Yes, I'm obliged because of our ties but it may not be the correct course. As a section of the public's feelings hardened, Stamfordham wrote urgently to the government from Windsor. Every day, the king is becoming more concerned about the question of the emperor and empress coming to this country. His majesty receives letters from people of all classes of life, saying As how much you know, the matter is from the first, the king has thought the presence of the imperial family in this country would raise all sorts of difficulties. The king changed his mind, I suspect very strongly put up to this by Stamfordham. And Stamfordham said, uh, what we must do is guard against a surge of republicanism in this country by being associated with a fallen tyrant. For the rest of that year, Nicholas and his family were under house arrest at Sasko Silo, still hoping to get to England. It's three years since Germany declared war on us. It's as though we'd lived a whole lifetime in those three years. Lord help and save Russia. The following spring, the Russian imperial family were moved to Siberia and later to a house at Ekaterinburg. Here, Nicholas made his last diary entry. Alexei's knee is getting better, but he still can't unbend it completely. The weather is warm and pleasant. We have no news whatsoever from the outside. Three days later, they were led down the steps to a basement room. They were all shot. Tell me, do you really think we had a choice? by letting them in. We could not know how things would develop. Did we have a choice? For the stability of the country, I don't think we had a choice. With all monarchies, self-preservation is the overriding factor. More than anything in the world, what monarchs want to do is to hang on to their thrones. In Germany, George's other cousin, the Kaiser, faced his own crisis. The people were starving, and revolution had spread to the cities. Once America entered the war, it was clear that Germany was defeated. 
America was against the old regime of Kaisers and Emperors, and the American president wouldn't make peace unless the Kaiser abdicated. On November the 9th, 1918, he left his fabulous palace at Potsdam forever and went into exile in Holland. And there he remained to the end of his days, Queen Victoria's eldest grandson. The very first thing he asked for as he arrived in Holland, he said, now, for a nice cup of good English tea. And he obviously had just spent the last four years fighting Britain, but what he wanted was, like an English gentleman, a nice cup of English tea. The survivors celebrated the end of the war, but there were nine million dead and scarcely any victors. The old Europe, the Europe of kings and emperors, was gone, replaced by something new. Democracy and republicanism had overtaken Victoria's dream. The map of Europe was now redrawn. The biggest change came to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It simply ceased to exist. All that was left was Austria, one-fifth of the former empire. Hungary became independent. Czechoslovakia became a republic. Serbs and Slavs united to become Yugoslavia. Romania, having backed the right side, doubled in size. Bulgaria, having backed the wrong side, was halved. Poland was carved out of Germany and Russia. Alsace-Lorraine went back to France. Belgium regained her occupied territory. And Britain, well, Britain was the only country that never had to change her boundaries and emerged triumphant. On the 11th of November, 1918, the people flocked to Buckingham Palace. They were filled with victory and happiness and relief. And now they came to cheer George V and Queen Mary, their king and queen. George V, the only one of the three cousins to survive as monarch, standing on the balcony, saluting his people. And where was Johnny, the lost prince, on that day? Perhaps behind an upper window of the palace, looking down on all those cheering crowds below. Looking down on the Victoria Memorial in front of Buckingham Palace, built to commemorate Victoria's dynastic dream. A dream which was gone forever. <laughs>